Hey guys, Brock Schott here. Back with you with the next video in our series, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Great Expectations. He was a secret looking man whom I had never seen before. His head was all on one side and one of his eyes was half shut up as if he were taking aim at something with an invisible gun. He had a pipe in his mouth and he took it out and, after slowly blowing all his smoke away and looking hard at me all the time, nodded. So I nodded, and then he nodded, and made room on the settle beside him that I might sit down there. But I was used to sit beside I used but as I was used to sit beside Joe. Whenever I entered that place of resort, I said, No thank you, sir, and fell into the space Joe made for me on the opposite settle. The strange man, after glancing at Joe, and seeing that his attention was otherwise engaged, nodded to me again when I had taken my seat, and then rubbed his leg in a very odd way as it struck me. You were saying, said the strange man, turning to Joe, that you was a blacksmith. Yes, I said it, you know, said Joe. What'll you drink, mister? You didn't mention you... You didn't mention your name, by the by. Joe mentioned it now, and the strange man called him by it. What'll you drink, Mr. Gardry, at my expense, to top up with? Well, said Joe, to tell you the truth, I ain't much in the habit of drinking at anyone's expense but my own. Habit, no, returned the stranger, but once in a way on a Saturday night, too. Come, put a name to it, Mr. Gardry. I wouldn't wish to be stiff company, said Joe. Rum. Rum, repeated the stranger. And will the other gentleman originate a sentiment? Rum, said Mr. Wopsle. Three rums, cried the stranger, calling to the landlord. Glasses round. This other gentleman, observed Joe, by way of introducing Mr. Wopsle, is a gentleman that you would like to hear give it out. Our clerk at church. Aha! said the stranger, quickly, and cocking his eye at me. The lonely church, right out on the marshes, with graves round it. That's it, said Joe. The stranger, with a comfortable kind of grunt over his pipe, put his legs up on the settle that he had to himself. He wore a flapping, broad-brimmed traveler's hat, and under it a handkerchief tied over his head in the manner of a cap, so that he showed no hair. As he looked at the fire, I thought I saw a cunning expression, followed by a half-laugh, come into his face. I am not acquainted with this country, gentlemen, but it seems a solitary country toward the river. Most marshes is solitary, said Joe. No doubt, no doubt. Do you find any gypsies now, or tramps, or vagrants of any sort out there? No, said Joe. None but a runaway convict now and then, and we don't find them easy, eh, Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle, with a majestic remembrance of old discomfiture, assented, but not warmly. Seems you have been out after such, asked the stranger. Once, returned Joe, not that we wanted to take them, you understand. We went out as lookers on me and Mr. Wopsle and Pip. Didn't us, Pip? Yes, Joe. The stranger looked at me again, still cocking his eye, as if he were expressly taking aim at me with his invisible gun, and said, He's a likely young parcel of bones, that. What is it you call him? Pip, said Joe. Christened Pip? No, not christened Pip. Surname Pip? No, said Joe. It's kind of a family name. What he gave himself when he's an when an, when a, himself when an infant and is called by, son of yours, well said Joe, meditatively, not of course, that could be in any wise necessary to consider about it, but because it was the way at the jolly bargeman to seem to consider deeply about everything that was discussed over pipes, well, no, no he ain't, Nevy, said the strange man. Well, said Joe, 
with the same appearance of profound cogitation. He is not, no, not to deceive you. He is not, my nevy. What the blue blazes is he? asked the stranger, which appeared to me to be an inquiry of unnecessary strength. Mr. Wopsle struck in about that, as one who knew all about relationships, having professional occasion to bear in mind what female relations a man might not marry, and expounded the ties between me and Joe, having his hand in. Mr. Wopsle finished off with the most terrifically snarling passage from Richard III, and seemed to think he had done quite enough to account for it when he added, as the poet says. And here I may remark that when Mr. Wopsle referred to me, he considered a necessary part of such reference to rumple my hair and poke it into my eyes. I cannot conceive why everybody of his standing who visited our house should always have put me through the same inflammatory process under similar circumstances. Yet I do not call to mind that I was ever in my earlier youth the subject of, rem of remark in our social family circle, but some large-handed person took some such ophthalmic steps to patronize me. All this while, the strange man looked at nobody but me, and looked at me as if he were determined to have a, to have a shot at me at last and bring me down. But, he said, nothing after offering his blue blazes observation, until the glasses of rum and water were brought, and then he made his shot, and a most extraordinary shot it was. It was not a verbal remark, but a proceeding in dump show, and was pointedly addressed to me. He stirred his rum and water pointedly at me, and he tasted his rum and water pointedly at me. And he stirred it, and he tasted it, not with a spoon that was brought to him, but with a file. He did this so that nobody but I saw a file. And when he had done it, he wiped the file and put it in a breast pocket. I knew it to be Joe's file, and I knew that he knew my convict. The moment I saw the instrument, I sat gazing at him, spellbound. But he now reclined on his settle, taking very little notice of me, and talking principally about turnips. There was a delicious sense of cleaning up, and making a quiet pause before going on in life afresh, in our village on Saturday nights, which stimulated Joe to dare to stay out half an hour longer on Saturdays than at other times. The half hour and the rum and water running out together Joe got up to go and took me by the hand. Stop half a moment, Mr. Gartry, said the strange man. I think I've got a bright new shilling somewhere in my pocket, and if I have, the boy shall have it. He looked it out from a handful of small change, folded it in some crumpled paper, and gave it to me. Yours, said he. Mind, your own. I thanked him staring at him far beyond the bounds of good manners, and holding tight to Joe. He gave Joe good night, and he gave Mr. Wopsle good night, who went out with us, and he gave me only a look with his aiming eye. No, not a look, for he shut it up, but wonders may be done with an eye by hiding it. On the way home, if I had been in for a humor, for talking, the talk must have been all on my side, for Mr. Wopsles parted from us at the door of the Jolly Bargeman, and Joe went all the way home with his mouth wide open to rinse the rum out with as much air as possible. But I was in a manner stupefied by this turning up of my old misdeed and old acquaintance and could think of nothing else. My sister was not in a very bad temper when we presented ourselves in the kitchen, and Joe was encouraged by that unusual circumstance to tell her about the bright shilling. A bad un, I'll be bound, said Mrs. Joe triumphantly, or he wouldn't have given it to the boy. Let's look at it. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching 
and I hope you enjoy. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.